Thank you, Andrew, and uh, Mina, and Joshua, Scott, and Guy for helping with uh, our worship time. Nice to see uh, some uh, friendly faces back that I haven't seen in a while, so welcome to church, uh, one and all. I'm so glad that we can worship the Lord together, and it's uh, also exciting to see how enthusiastic our children are. 
uh, and uh, I know they're putting together a nice program for us. So, so it's going to be um, on the 18th. Uh, there'll be some video sections and there'll be some um, live sections when they're up here zipping around, singing and uh, us singing with them. So it's nice to see uh, to see them. I, I saw the, some of them dressed up and getting ready and Andrew's been videotaping that. And so thank you. And so pray for our children, you know. It's uh, it's only for a few brief moments in our lives that we are children, and and then the rest of the time we're responsible for something. And so it's, uh, but we just pray that they get the best start possible, and that uh, we would always be found providing a loving environment here where they are welcome, but also where they learn about Jesus, because Christ is the foundation of our lives. And when we have Christ, we have hope, and we and we have God's word. We then we know how to live our life, and so we're trying. That's what we try to do with our children is teach them the ways of Jesus uh, while loving them and, uh, and doing our best and, and as, as the followers of Christ. So pray for our, our teachers. Um, we're going to dive in in a second into Isaiah 49. Last week we started a, a, a short mini-series as we finish up our time in the book of Isaiah together. Isaiah is a big book. It's actually not the biggest book in the Bible. Um, Jeremiah is is the biggest book in the Bible in terms of words. You would Psalms has 150 chapters, Isaiah has 66 chapters, uh, and Jeremiah, which has a few chapters less, but actually is is the biggest book in the whole Bible in terms of actual word count. But whatever book we're in, one of the things that we've been discovering is that the Bible is all about Jesus. Wherever you turn. Um, there, we, you will encounter the thread of God's redemptive love um, that his plan to save us, to bring us into a relationship with him. Because when our first parents sinned and rebelled against God, God wasn't taken by surprise, but he had a plan uh, that to bring us into right relationship with him. The plan of redemption, the story of salvation, uh, bound up in the person of Christ. So when you read the Bible, um, it has 66 books, but they're not 66 individual books. The Bible is one book um, telling the story ultimately of Christ and a right relationship with, with him. Heavenly Father, we pray as we look into your word this morning that you would uh, lead and guide us, speak to each of our hearts by your spirit, and, and that we would be drawn to you and that we would enthrone you in our lives and that uh, you would be at the center of all that we do. We need your help and your wisdom each day. Uh, we need your strength. We, uh, uh, there are many things and on our plates that are really impossible for us. And so we pray that you would just, uh, we would be found giving them to you, that you would take them from us, and that however, the, whatever the path looks like, that we'd be found trusting you, Lord, and putting you first, uh, and uh, that we might, uh, we might see uh, your work and discern uh, your spirit working within us and we, our desire as your followers is that people would see Christ in us um, through whatever it is we're going. And so we thank you for your mercy and your grace. And we praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Last week, uh, we looked at the first of the servant songs. Um, Isaiah speaks of a servant of the Lord who is coming to bring justice to the nations. And it was kind of neat because it's always interesting how uh, when you look at the Bible, when we think about the subject of justice, we... We as Christians sometimes make a mistake. We think of justice often as just being retributive in nature. But that's not what the Bible actually teaches us about justice. There, is a, there, there are various components to justice. There's distributive justice, procedural justice. Um, there is a, a retribution in the sense of punishment for sin and transgression. But the Bible is actually, like I said, one of the errors we make is when we think of God, we think when we hear about God's justice, we just sometimes think, oh, that's the consequence for our sin. But God's justice actually leads us to his, the redemptive, restorative part of his justice. The, the restorative part is, is how can one who has been an enemy of God their whole life now be a friend of God and be at peace with God? It's because a sacrifice has been provided. Christ laid down his life on the cross for our sins, took the punishment that we deserve that we might be restored to him. Restorative justice is being in right relationships after all the mess. 
And we see that that is modeled to us ultimately in the, in the person and the cross of Christ. And then we say, okay, how do I then apply that in living out my life too when because of issues that we have with people? And so it's, so that's the, one of the beautiful things about the scriptures is, and it's a little corrective for us as Christians when we think about what is justice about. Ultimately, God's plan to bring us into right relationship with him through, through Christ. Today, uh, we're going to be, the, the passage we're going to look at is, it's a bit more complex. Um, Isaiah 42, there is one coming who will bring justice uh, to the nations. And in, and in Psalm, and Isaiah 49, there's a few additional facets that are added to this picture of the one who is the servant of the Lord. We see in focus today, we're going to see very clearly the humanity of Christ uh, being emphasized. We learn from God's word that God became a man and dwelt in our in our midst. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we have seen his glory, says John in, in John chapter 1. Um, and so the humanity of Christ is is in focus in the text. But there's also the aspect of God's timing of sending this this one who will save at just the right time uh, into our world. We see the timing component. We also see um, uh, Jesus, the servant of the Lord, he being everything Israel was supposed to be but failed to do. Israel had been called by the Lord to be a light to the nations, um, a focal point for the world that would display God's glory, that they were to be obedient and not to dabble in the in the false gods of the religions of the world around them, and yet they basically did their own thing. Uh, and in Christ's coming, Jesus comes, uh, and he is everything unfaithful Israel was supposed to be. Uh, and so he's, he's, he's called Israel in the text. And so what I want us to do in the time that we have, there are seven verses in the passage, but I want us just to walk real slow through these verses and unpack this really this amazing... Um, portion of scripture. And it begins, uh, listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed, you, formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. And he says, it's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I've kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who is despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. There's a lot of meat on the bone here. There's a lot going on in this passage. It's a passage about Christ. It's who is called the servant of the Lord. And so I just want us to step one step at a time, unpacking it. Let's think about the first part. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. The same language being used in Isaiah 42. And the message is, from that, is the message and saving work of Christ is for all people. Not just for the Jew, but for all peoples on the earth. And so this, this clarion call is given out. Listen to me, nations of the earth. I have some good news for you. There's one who's coming to save you. The, the second aspect that's there is we see of the, the incarnation of Christ, we see uh, a, a veiled note to the virgin birth of Christ because it says, before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. He's spoken my name and twice in the text in verse five as well, talking about his mother's womb. And so when we think about um, we think about Christ who is declared to us to be fully God and fully man, 
And he didn't enter our world as a full-grown adult. Um, he came in the most humblest of fashions. He came by, uh, he came by the Virgin Mary and entered our world and started right at the beginning as a baby. And so it speaks of, before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb, he spoke in my name. And if you're looking for how the Bible links together, you realize that when Mary uh, is with child, the angel of the Lord appears to her and says, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Uh, and so she, she was troubled by her pregnancy and God sent an angel to assure her. God also sent an angel to talk to Joseph about it. Uh, but the, the message is, is that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't Joseph or someone, uh, some male on the other side of the family that was determining the name. The Lord says, no, this is the name of the one who, who is within you. His name is Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And so we see this linkage to this verse. Before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. He has spoken my name. Um, the, the other thing that's here is, is uh, God's plan when it says before I was born, the Lord called me, it's a plan formulated long ago. And this is kind of fascinating. In First Peter, First P in First Peter, he, Peter writes, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And here's the verse which is kind of a, an expansive verse, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. And so the marvel of it all is, is our first parents' act of sin and rebellion against God was not a surprise to him. Um, in fact, he already knew what they would do. This, the, I mean, this introduces the big subjects beyond the scope of today's sermon of God's sovereignty and our free will and how all those things interact with each other. And we all have those questions as Christians. But what is this declaration is God had a plan before he made the world to send one to save us because he wasn't surprised when our parents sinned against him. And he had a, because of God's uh, restorative, the restorative component of God's justice, he says, I have a plan to restore those who are in a position of being hostile to me into right relationship with me, uh, and at just the right time. Then verse two, um, here's something, when we think about, go ahead, uh, Scott, um, God, there's God's perfect timing in sending his son. Um, when he, the time had fully come, God sent a son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might redeem, receive adoption to sonship. Uh, and here it speaks about the, the words of this one, the servant of the Lord, being like a sharpened sword and being like a polished arrow. And yet the emphasis in verse two is on the hiddenness. And the hiddenness meaning that there is the proper time for his coming, for his revelation. But we also are reminded of that the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we think about all the way back to the account of creation. How does the world and the universe and the stars and everything come into being? It's not some titanic struggle. It's not with great effort. The Lord merely speaks and it, and it becomes. And so there's this emphasis on, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword. Uh, the power of the word of God. And when Christ is doing a miracle, whether it's casting out an evil spirit or healing the sick, or raising the dead, uh, what, how does Christ often do his work? He speaks. All he has to do is speak. He's in the boat, and there is a storm, and the disciples are um, freaking out because they think they're going to die. And Jesus gets up, and he just merely says, the, says to the wind and the waves, be calm, and they're still. Uh, and so the power of Christ's word, um, but also it reminded us, you know, sometimes, sometimes when we read God's word, we're unmoved, but other times when we're reading God's word, we are cut straight to the core and, and our eyes are opened and we realize uh, we, we, there's, a, there's a great sense of wonderment. There's a great sense of conviction. Uh, sometimes it's, it's understanding that we didn't have before, but it's because it says in Hebrews 12 of chapter four, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. So you see the sword connection and it penetrates to dividing soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. 
Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so the word became flesh and dwelt in our midst uh, and, and Christ at just the right time coming to save us. Verse three, um, I already mentioned Jesus in his incarnation is the ultimate servant. He displayed the father's glory. He was everything that Israel was supposed to be. Uh, that's the, that's the, the thrust of, of, of this third verse. And you know, when you and I think about Jesus being everything Israel was supposed to be, when you and I think about our, our walk with the Lord, we want others when they see us um, to be like, what is, what is it with you? Why are you the way you are? And our answer as Christians is, is because of my relationship with Christ, this is why I am the way I am. And, and, and in a positive sense, sometimes, it's, sometimes Christians are embarrassing, right? <laughs> um, and you're like, that's not Christian behavior, all right? <laughs> uh, and, and other times, someone will be like, I don't know what it is about you. You have a peace about you. You're, you're not responding like everyone else. What is it about you? Why is, and, we, and at that point, we can humbly say, I'm trying to follow Christ because it's not about us or what we're doing. But we, as, as it says, in whom I will display my splendor, um, Christ came to glorify the Father. What is our purpose as Christians? Is to glorify the Father, that others would see Jesus in us and the way we conduct ourselves. Uh, the fourth uh, verse is, you know, here's the thing. I talked about this passage highlights the humanity of Christ. The Bible teaches Jesus being fully man and fully God. And Jesus' miracles, whether it be over sickness, over death, over evil spirits, over nature, um, all meant to say, hey, who else in the world could this be but God in our midst who can do these things? That's the point of those miracles. The miracles of Christ is to lead us to the correct conclusion that God is in our midst. But there's also the, the, the other side is, is that Jesus, though his full humanity, um, born, of, born of Mary, um, and also his frustration, because here we have, and it's hard for us to imagine this being sort of, I have labored in vain, I have spent my strength for nothing, that sometimes you and I have this experience um, of, in our life, we can easily identify with it, because you're like, you know, here I am trying to follow God, and my life just keeps getting harder, <laughs> right? Or here I am trying to teach my kids about the Lord, and it seems they're going further away. Uh, or, or here I'm trying to do the right thing in, in the business world, and I, I, I just, all I do is get, is push back. And sometimes there's a sense of, um, it seems to be all uphill, uh, and, it's, and it seems to be difficult all the time. And, and yet, the, the, if this is spoken of, of the, the frustration that Christ experienced in his earthly ministry. Um, you know, I remember the scene where Jesus he, he, he often spoke in parables and in language that made, he was, they were, it was meant to make people think. But he says, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part with me. And that was a pivotal moment because it says lots of people walked away from Jesus that day because they took it literally. And Jesus wasn't speaking literally. He was speaking spiritually. Uh, and then he says to his disciples, he says, do you want to go too? And they're like, who else? Who are, who? We're not leaving. There's no one to go else to. You are the Lord. You're the Messiah. They saw it, but all these other folks were just hangers on, actually. Um, and, and so the, there's a certain level of frustration. Uh, and, and yet, the, we also see side by side with that is we, we saw it in, introduced to us in chapter 42, the faithfulness and the persistence of Christ um, in his mission, in coming to save us, even though a lot of people are like, I don't need saving and I don't want to be saved. <laughs> I'm just happy doing what I'm doing. Um, and, and yet Christ persisted. And the amazing thing is, despite our, our resistance, God says, the offer is still on the table for you to be saved and to be restored to me and to be, and to be forgiven. That's the amazing grace of God, is he just doesn't say, well, you blew your chance, pal. The amazing grace of God is, is it is there as long as you are alive to be restored and reconciled to him. Um, but this feeling that you and I sometimes have is Christ knows what it means because he was fully God and fully man. 
Um, and yet his faith, his trust in your work and the love that you've shown him as you've helped his people and continue to help them. So the call is, when it's hard, don't give up. When you're doing the right thing and it looks like you're the only one doing the right thing or caring about doing the right thing because, because of Christ, uh, and you feel like quitting, don't quit. Keep pressing on. Be faithful. Christ himself knew what it was to struggle against, against those who didn't want to hear and didn't want to listen. And we often read of plots against his life. And yet, what do, we, what do we see about Christ? With a resoluteness, he carried on. And ultimately, with a resoluteness, he fixed his face and went to Jerusalem and went to the cross. And so Isaiah is talking about the humanity of Christ, but you and I can identify with it. Uh, number verse 5 and we're, we're in the last half here. Uh, again, this, this speaking about the humanity of Christ is being born ultimately uh, of Mary in the womb. Uh, but we see, we see in verse 5 and 6 something kind of neat. We see a twofold aspect to the mission of Christ. First aspect of the mission of Christ was to restore Israel uh, and redeem Israel uh, of the line of Jacob. Um, and, and so Christ's mission uh, to come, uh, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. Mission, mission part one came for Israel, came for the Jew, uh, uh, part of God's salvation plan. Um, and then the second component, go ahead, uh, Scott, is part two is not... Jesus did not just come to save those who are Jewish. He actually came to save all people everywhere. But it, this is a kind of a neat verse because uh, when we see this twofold component to Christ's saving work, came to restore Israel to himself, but not just to restore Israel to himself, but to extend the offer of salvation to any who would believe and put their faith in him uh, anywhere on the planet. Um, and it has to do with, what the, look at the amazing language of verse 6. God, the Father says, it's too small a thing for you to be my servant just to restore the tribes of Jacob. God's salvation plan. In fact, when you back it up and you look at, go, go back into Genesis, Abram was the father. Ultimately, there's Abram came before Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. But before that, there was a guy named Abram, whom then God named him Abraham. Abraham means father. Abraham means father of many. Um, and, and God says to Abram at his calling, first it says of Abram that Abram, when God said to Abram, he says, I'm going to do all these things for you. It says Abram believed God and God credited to him that is righteousness. And that's kind of a little, very telling verse because it tells us that salvation and right standing with God has never been by works, but it's always been by faith. It's because Abram believed God that he was credited with righteousness. Salvation is by faith, not by works. And Abram is the father of faith because God says, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you land, seed, which means lots of people, and I'm going to bless you. In fact, I'm going to bless you so much that the whole world is going to be blessed through you. And you ask the question, how is the whole world going to be blessed through you? Well, because God's salvation plan was not just to save those of the line of Abram, but his, his plan is to save people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And so this, the plan of God has always included all people. But in terms of order, Jesus came first to save the Jew and then to save the, the Gentile. And, and this is brought together in Romans chapter 1, um, verses 15 and 16. And it says, it's, it's, in a, it's always, a, you know, sometimes there's head-scratching verses where you're like, I don't understand. But after you, once we can connect the dots, we're like, oh, well, that makes sense now. In, in Romans chapter 1, it says, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation for everyone who believes. Now, a lot of times if you look that verse up on, on Google, you're like, oh, I want a Bible verse. And you type in Romans 1 15, they conveniently, conveniently leave the second half of the verse out, right? They just stop at that salvation is for all who believe. But then Paul says, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And you're like, oh, well, that's weird. Why? What's this distinguishing? Well, Isaiah makes a, makes a distinguisher. Christ, the first part of Christ's mission is 
is to restore Israel back to the Lord. Um, but that's not the extent of his mission. His mission is to bring all people who would surrender themselves to him to right relationship with him. That's the amazing scope and wideness of God's grace. That's, that's the beautiful thing of Christ and the cross is that when Jesus laid down his life, he laid down his life uh, for all people that who, whoever would take hold of him in faith and repentance might come to have eternal life. And sometimes people, they back it up and they're like, I've done too many bad things. You don't know my story. God knows your story perfectly. Um, and here's the thing. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, there, there are no perfect people. There's All of us are, are sinners in the sight of God. Uh, and, and, a, and apart from Christ, that's our standing. And yet God says, you know what? I love you so much that I sent my son to die for you. And here's how you can be restored to me. Here's how we can have a right relationship. Here's how you can come to be my child and have, have my blessings and have eternal life. And God, this is, this is the thing about free will. God says, you have a choice. What are you going to do? You can accept my offer, and I want you to accept my offer, but you also have the freedom to not accept my offer. But that's the wideness of God's mercy. That's the beauty of God's grace. Uh, and that's why when we teach our children uh, or talk to anyone, no one's forcing anyone to become a Christian. But our job is to tell the truth and to model a, a a good Christian life. And when you and I mess up, because one of the things that uh, anyone, actually, here's the thing. Anyone that has standards is a hypocrite, <laughs> right? If you don't have standards, well, then you're not going to be a hypocrite. But as soon as you say, I have a standard, you are going to break it. And Christians are hypocrites, aren't they? Uh, and, and so, but when, when, when someone says, ah, I caught you red-handed, right? As a Christian, what are we supposed to do? Don't hide from it. Um, just own it and say, you know what? I was wrong. Um, that was wrong of me. I don't, I, that's not the person I know I'm supposed to be. And so we own it. Um, and because our testimony in the community is really important. And so when someone says that's not Christian behavior, then indeed we don't try to make up, make us something up. We say, you know what? I actually am a sinner saved by grace. Thank you for pointing that out to me. I'm going to try to be the person I'm supposed to be in Christ. Um, rather than them walking away and say, well, all Christians are the same and they're all inconsistent. But, but even when our own kids, when we mess things up as parents, is to teaching them about, here I am struggling to live the Christian life. I can't do it on my own. But how amazing it is that when I was a sinner, uh, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me so that I could be right with him. This is the amazing grace of God that Isaiah is celebrating to us in the person of Christ. Um, and then last verse uh, is, it speaks of um, the, how Jesus would be despised. And you know, Christ, you know, when we think about on a pure quantitative level, when Christ ascends into, into heaven, how many people are there as his followers? There's 12, right? And you'd be like, that's, uh, there's the 12 disciples and there's a, there's a group of others, of, of, uh, of other people that are, uh, we don't know the total number, but it wasn't very many people. Uh, and so you look, you're like, oh, but, you know, despite him being rejected by the vast majority of people, it was mission accomplished. He entered our world, he died on the cross as a once for all sacrifice. And he said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. And you were to go into all the world and preach the gospel and tell people of, what I've, of who I am and what I've done and how to be right with God. Uh, and that is the mission of the church. And so, though despised, the Bible tells us that every knee is going to bow before Christ. Uh, and, and, and so we think about the, the ultimate victory of Christ, who, despite the pushback, despite the rejection, God's word is that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the, that's the beautiful end of, of this story, is that we serve a risen Savior who is coming back for us and every, eye will, every knee will bow before him. And in the meantime, we say, Lord, help me to be faithful. I realize, you know, when I think about, you know, that back to verse four in that whole uh, point of, you know, it seems that it's all in vain and we, this, you know, what is our biggest struggle as Christians is uh, sometimes it's our behavior, right? But behind it is what's going on in our head, in our heart, right? 
We want to do the right thing. Sometimes we do the right thing just because other people are watching us. But ultimately, it's getting our attitude and our heart in the right place um, and saying, you know what, Lord, I am discouraged. I am tired. I, I do. This is how I feel. I, but I'm not going to give up. I want to press on because I want you to be glorified. I want Christ, people to see Christ. I want people to realize that I have a hope that transcends this world. And I'm going to hold on to your promises, and I, and I, and, but I need your strength to do it because I can't do this on my own. That's the Christian life. And as always coming back and saying, and here we come to the table, what is the table of, of the Lord about? We see in these, we see in these symbols, we see, we see the juice, we see the cracker, but they're reminders of us of the blood of Christ shed for us, the body of Christ broken for us, Christ's command in is that we gather as believers, that we regularly remember what he's done. Because it's so easy to go astray, isn't it? So easy to forget what it is we're supposed to be doing and what it's all about. And, and it's, our faith is all about Jesus and, and bringing glory to his name and living for him and holding on to him when, 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 it, when it's difficult. Because we see one of the emphasis of this text is Christ and he came as a servant. He came and experienced full humanity, fully God and fully man. And so when Christ experienced pushback, it's no surprise that if Christ was experiencing some level of discouragement and frustration, that we too will face the same things. And yet Christ pressed on and completed the mission and, it, and he brought glory to the Father. And you and I say, you know what? I wanna be like Jesus. I want to follow in his footsteps. And when, you know, sometimes we're like, does Jesus understand what I'm going through? Yes, that's the whole point of becoming one of us, his perfect identification with us, but coming on a mission to save us. And so as we come to the table this morning, and go ahead to that slide, that's the, the uh, communion slide, Scott. Um, you know, we think about connecting, uh, we think about Christmas, we think about Advent. Last week, Ruth talked to us about hope. Our only hope is in Christ. Jesus is the hope of the world. Uh, but there's also the component of love. The Bible says, and, and uh, it used to be if you were at a football game, there'd always be a guy in the end zone holding a sign that said John 3.16. Um, and for a good period of time, people knew what John 3.16 was. Now they see a guy with a sign that says John 3.16, you're like, I don't know. Right? It's just because people don't. Like the rest of the verse isn't there. But John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's God's love. Um, the Bible says um, it's, it's not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as a redeeming sacrifice for our sin. God is the initiator of the relationship. We're the one running away. He's the one that's actually in pursuit and draws us to himself by his Holy Spirit and opens our eyes up to the beauty of the cross, the beauty of Christ, as one who came on a rescue mission to save us, to save us from our sins, to save us from the judgment to come, to restore us to right relationship with himself. And so as we come to this table today, we think about all that we've worked our way through. We've worked our way through a lot of stuff. It's a complex passage. Um, I wish it was as easy as chapter 42, um, about, uh, but, it's, but that's the beauty of scripture and the linking of learning how to tie the Bible together. That's a beautiful thing, Isaiah 49. It just intersects with so many other passages and helps us understand the rest of God's word. But as we come, as we come to the table, we think about the love of Christ, but don't just leave it as, thank you, Jesus, for coming and loving me in that way. The, the next step is, is because of your love, because of your forgiveness in my life, help me to pass that on to people that I, irritate me. <laughs> that's, the, that's the reality, isn't it, right? The experience of God's love and forgiveness is not just a, thank you, God. I'm going to go through the rest of my day with a smile on my face because I, I remembered what you did for me. But then you're like, thank you, God, and help me to love my cousin who's driving me crazy or my kid who's driving me crazy, or my spouse who's driving me crazy. Like that's where the, that's the rubber hitting the road, right? Is to experience his love is also to say, Lord, I want to be that vessel 
and and I want to uh, that well, I want to be that channel to others because I love you, and I know that means loving others. Um, but then we realize I need God's help. That's what our daily walk with Jesus is about: is walking with Him, spending time with Him, but also saying, "Okay, I know you a bit better, but now help me to live that bit better out in my relations." And so, please take a moment to pray, and then Andre is going to come and. Uh, and Christina are going to come and help with, the, with our uh, table today. So let's pray together. I'd like you to uh, stand with me as we close our service. And we're going to close it with uh, our saying together of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen.